Hello, everyone. And I believe we are live. I see attendees are still uh, being added to the room. So we're going to give us a few minutes before we get started. Substantively, uh, my name is Scott Anderson. I'm a senior editor at Lawfare, uh, uh, among a series of other hats at the Brookings Institution at Columbia Law School and other places. Um, thank you all so much for joining us here today for a live podcast recording of the Lawfare podcast, our daily podcast on national security, law and policy uh, from the Lawfare Institute. Uh, you all, some of you who listen to Lawfare may be familiar with me or have attended some of our Lawfare live events in the past. Um, uh, I'm excited to have you here. This is a little bit of a different event. Um, obviously, over the last 48 hours, we have seen a set of historical developments in Afghanistan that were uh, substantially uh, unanticipated, certainly at least at the timing uh, level, uh, that are really just completely changed the landscape uh, of uh, how U.S. policy and U.S. Uh, really international communities involvement in Afghanistan has been shape for the last two decades. Um, and because of that, we wanted to try and get a conversation going as soon as we can at the top of the week um, to try and help inform uh, our readers and the general public uh, and ourselves about what to make of these developments. So we're incredibly lucky to have a trio of fant fantastic uh, experts here. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a live podcast recording, um, so we may have a little bit of stage direction happening uh, in the interim, so apologies for that. Uh, I do save the introductions to record separately after the fact, so we are going to get, jump right into the questions. Uh, our three speakers, uh, you know, I've, I've linked to their biographies uh, in the post for the website, so uh, you can find more information about them there. Uh, otherwise, we are just going to lump, rump, <clears throat> excuse me, we are just going to jump in and get started. And that is an example of the things we will edit out for the podcast version for that you are seeing live here. Uh, with that, um, let's get ready. Everybody should get ready and record. Uh, and I should say, by the way, before you start, Jonathan is joining us in audio form only uh, and so and is uh, in transit somewhere. So um, we're giving him a few minutes to get settled before we turn to him with some questions. Um, so to begin. So for over the last 48 hours, we have seen a really dramatic sequence of events taking place in Afghanistan. We have seen the Afghan government fall, the government that the United States, its NATO allies, a good part of the international community has been supporting for two decades. Uh, that was intended to play a central role in the post-withdrawal engagement, US engagement with Afghanistan as a vehicle for <laughs> assistance for partnership. Uh, how, what led us here? Can you give us, uh, Laurel, a, a, a sense of the big events over the last few days that led to the sudden collapse in this very different state of affairs that we are now facing in Afghanistan and in Kabul? Thanks, Scott. Uh, thanks for having me on the, the podcast. I mean, I think in terms of how we got here, you have to look at some longer term uh, trajectories that have been observable in Afghanistan by people who have been watching closely, as well as the precipitating factors. So it, in a way it happened all of a sudden, but what we've seen uh, materialize in recent days has been happening in a slower motion over a long period of time and then accelerated greatly in the, in the recent days. And that is true on both sides of the equation here. On the Taliban side, in terms of their strategy and their comparative strengths, and on the Afghan government side, uh, in terms of their uh, weaknesses, and what we saw happen in the last couple of weeks and in the, the final days of the regime of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan uh, was, I think, much more a function of the collapse on the government side than changes in the military equation on the, uh, on the Taliban side. And we can get into some of the details, think about what the Taliban strategy has been over a long period of time. Uh, but you know, it's not as if something in the last few weeks, even with the, the US military withdrawal, greatly changed in terms of Afghan security force capabilities or Taliban uh, fighting forces capabilities. What changed was a collapse of the system 
on the Afghan government side, a, a collapse of confidence on the part of the security forces and political elements in the ability of the Afghan government to endure in the absence of an on the ground American backing uh, for the government. Uh, and some of the factors that we've seen contribute to the collapse uh, are, you know, sort of rot within the systems and incapabilities within the systems. I mean, lack of um, payment of fighters. I mean, who's going to fight when they're not being paid and fed? Uh, I, we've seen on the political side, the, the longer term trend of the now erstwhile Afghan government under President Ghani not reaching out to a not building loyalty and commitment on the part of a wide array of Afghan political actors to his government uh, is part of what contributed to the abandonment of his government. For a long period of time, you know, you've seen those problems and you've seen when, the, when threats from the Taliban insurgency have spiked, you've seen at certain moments a kind of rallying around the the uh, the government, even when there were political disagreements, we saw this as far back as 2015, the first time the important city of Kunduz was overrun by the Taliban. You know, when it, there were political problems and disunity, even then, and the political elites, when they looked over the edge of the abyss, they sort of stuck with the Afghan government, a government that the U.S. and NATO was sticking with, and uh, but. By 2021, that wasn't the case anymore. Um, so those are, those are among some of the factors that contributed to um, collapse of confidence in the durability of the Afghan government and of it being worth it to stick with it. And, I, and I'm sure that um, Medea and Jonathan will have further thoughts to add on this, how we got here question. And I, I guess the last thing I would say is, you know, that there, there's gonna need to be a lot of retrospective analysis of this in the days, weeks, months, and years ahead, if there's gonna be some lesson learning, particularly on the part of the, the foreign protagonists in this drama. And so I, I just want to say, you know, I, I, I'm giving you these thoughts now, but um, I have enough humility to not think that anything I say at this moment and uh, this day is definitive in terms of this retrospective analysis. I think that's a good caveat for us all to have in this conversation and, and all the conversations we're having over the next few days, because there's a lot of learning to be done over what has happened. Um, Maria, let me turn to you next. I wanna spin off of one of the issues Laurel touched on, which is that over the last, well, several weeks really, but particularly over the last week, at least in the way it's been captured by uh, the Western media lens, which admittedly I'm consuming a lot of this information through, one of the most unanticipated and most influential trends, uh, at least from my non-expert eye, has seemed to be the somewhat exceptional ability of the Taliban through uh, a degree of coercion and intimidation, through a degree of negotiation, through a degree of co-optation to convince local political leaders, uh, and sometimes regional, uh, fairly high level political leaders, uh, military leaders, security force leaders, police force leaders, to at least not oppose them, to lay down arms and allow them to proceed to take over territory. Um, sometimes it, by some reports in some areas, largely in name only, not necessarily through the assertion of force, but just by the capitulation of those local authorities. And in some cases, even uh, kind of seeming to sign on to participate in some whatever comes next under the the Taliban rule, whether a continuing role in the local government. What are the factors that are driving that? What is the tool that the Taliban has um, to uh, convince these people? Is it simply the intimidation factor or is there a degree of co-optation and broadening the tent um, that might indicate that the political movement that comes out of the Taliban's assertion uh, might be a little more complicated and a little more diverse than it may seem at first impression? Thanks, Scott. Uh, that's a that's an important question. You know, what has contributed to the surrender? You know, uh, the laying down of arms essentially without actually you know fighting back. And I think Laurel addressed uh, that that question 
um, uh, in terms of sort of the, the collapse of will um, I think that came from the Afghan security forces. And I think, I think there's a broader sort of picture here than just sort of the, the surrender. It's the fact that the surrender has occurred without, uh, without US support. If there had been continued US support, my belief is that there would not have been a surrender in this manner, right? So the, the fact of the matter is that um, the, the sort of the quick, Pull out of um, uh, the, the the U.S. military withdrawal that happened over the summer essentially deprived these Afghan security forces of intelligence support, air support, air force support that they were so used to. Um, combined with sort of the fact that there are ghost soldiers, uh, that means there are soldiers on the books uh, that are you know security forces on the books that don't actually exist on the ground. Combined with the fact that they haven't been paid, the Taliban has actually. I mean, there are reports that the Taliban Taliban was paying them stipends for food as they were surrendering and leaving. So this goes to show the, you know, the extent of the rot and the corruption within um, the Afghan government, within Ghani's government and his military leaders, sort of the failure to inspire, the failure to lead that led to the sort of will collapsing. In some sense, you know, the US military um, uh, you know, presence in Afghanistan was propping up these security forces. So I think that's a really important point. I, I mean, if I could just sort of take, uh, and, and we'll be learning more about, you know, sort of the deals the Taliban struck uh, in local areas, but, um, you know, there is capitulation through intimidation in the sense that, you know, if you don't, um, will will kill you, and and we have seen even uh, sort of um, security forces who have surrendered reports of them being killed. So you know there is sort of the sense of why would I die for a government that does not care about me? Why don't I try to save my life? Um, you know, uh, and and sort of basically walk away. I think you know just sort of looking back, uh, you know there are sort of ways in which this withdrawal, if it were to happen, could have been done to mitigate uh, some of these factors. And we can talk about them more, um, but sort of not pulling out the rug from under the security forces would have been sort of my, my uh, number one recommendation, you know, sort of hand, they were used to handholding and, um, and, and, and needed that in order to fight the Taliban and they didn't have it. Jonathan, let me turn to you if that's okay, because that, that leads directly into the first question I, I wanna bring to you, because you and I had a conversation uh, on Lawfare Live uh, a few weeks ago, followed up by a piece of yours on Lawfare um, that, that made the case um, that it hasn't come true. Uh, and you were, I think, to your credit, very honest about this on Twitter, which can be a, a difficult moment, a, a mea culpa moment that frankly, any analyst, and I have had plenty of these myself, sometimes faces and it, it, the bravest and the right path is often to acknowledge uh, I was wrong and made a mistake and try and figure out why. Uh, and, and watching you do that has been a, 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 a really educational experience, but that I wanna bring out to the listener here, you know, you, you, you're you initially the expectation was the Afghan security forces would be able to hold out uh, a bit longer, at least in urban areas and areas where they could fortify where the air support and different resources would be able to make it hard for the Taliban to amass the type of force necessary to break through those fortifications. Um, but we didn't see at least the Afghan forces having the confidence that they would be able to do so, or at least it doesn't seem like that's the case. Was it just a lack of confidence? Was it a lack of cut off of, of these sorts of resources? Um, you know, What was the combination here that seems to, in your kind of ex post assessment, have led to the Afghan security forces being so less effective in retaining territory than many experts, outside the government, and I suspect many experts inside the government uh, expected from the outset? Sure, yeah, no, that's, those are great questions. And let me let me start by thanking you for having me on and thank the listeners for, for being here today. Um, I'll apologize in advance, I'm, I'm on daddy duty today. And so I'm, I'm actually uh, with the kids at the Air and Space Annex Museum. So if you hear a little bit of kitty noise in the background, that's, that's what's happening and I apologize uh, for that. Um, but to your point, I mean, right, if, if this was a, if I was on TV, I would try and give you sort of a pithy answer, but 
really, I, I think for this uh, audience, right, it, it deserves a little bit more introspection than that. I mean, the, the story is, is quite involved. Uh, and, you know, without giving the long, gory history, I might rewind the clock just a little bit to, to sort of set this up, because what we saw clearly over the last couple of months was a series of dominoes falling, right? A, a serious domino effect. And it's worth sort of taking a step back to ask when, you know, when did that chain of dominoes falling really start? And I would I would actually rewind the clock all the way to about 2006. And again, I'm not going to go through 14 years of history here, but, you know, quickly, you know, in, in 2006, when the Taliban really started to resurge, regain strength uh, in Afghanistan after the, you know, their initial defeat, the U.S. had at that point still not created sufficient Afghan security forces, uh, both in number and with sort of the capability to stem that resurgence. Uh, and so as it happened, the U.S. found itself on the back foot, you know, playing catch up to this resurgent Taliban insurgency. And it really never got out of that mode over the last 15 years. Um, even during the surge, right, I mean, we, we put a lot of money and investment into the Afghan security forces. We grew them to be, a, you know, a size of 300,000 or so. We gave them hundreds of, you know, 160 odd uh, aircraft and, you know, tens of thousands of vehicles and whatnot. But it was all in this, uh, you know, mode of, of, of trying to catch up with the Taliban's uh, resurgence. And what that meant practically was because we were fighting the Taliban as we were trying to build the Afghan security forces to get to a point where they could take over the fight, we were constantly in a mode of prioritizing operational necessity uh, over long-term sustainability. And so what did that mean? That meant that when we felt, you know, when we fielded a force of 300,000, the goal was to just get them in the field as quickly as you could. And, and they weren't always very well trained. They weren't always the best recruits, et cetera, et cetera, right? But it was get as many bodies into the field as you can, and we'll worry about the quality of those forces later. Similarly, on the equipment side, get them as much hardware, military hardware as you can, as quickly as possible, and we'll worry about the sustainment of all of that, whether they can actually operate it themselves, whether they can maintain it and sustain it over the long term. We'll worry about all of that later, right? And that's been the mindset of the, the you know, effort to develop the forces over the last 15 years. Um, and so what did, what did that ultimately lead to? Well, it led to the sort of things that Medea described where they have become, the Afghan security forces had become incredibly dependent on the US for air support, for maintenance of their own aircraft, their armored vehicles, uh, for management of their personnel systems, for management of their pay systems, management of their logistics systems. I mean, all of the backshop things that you need to have, the institutional things that you need to have for a security force to be effective over the longer term simply weren't there. So what did that mean over the last couple of months? That meant when the Taliban started pushing in rural areas to take these you know, rural districts, especially up in the north, Initially, there were efforts by the Afghan security forces in those areas, not all of them, but by a good number of these units to try and defend the areas that they were in. And what happened is they stood and fought for a day, two days, sometimes longer, uh, and they started to run out of ammunition and they started to run out of food. They started to run out of water. They started to get overrun and they would call for airstrikes and they wouldn't come. They would call for reinforcements and they wouldn't come. And so eventually they would turn and flee. And word of that spread, right, to many other Afghan army and police units that, hey, these, you know, these guys tried to fight and they got nothing from Kabul. And many of them died in the process. So, you know, when it becomes then, if, if you're hearing that in other parts of the country and it now becomes your turn to stand and fight against that Taliban onslaught and you're not convinced that you're going to get more ammo, food, water, airstrikes, reinforcements. Why would you stand and fight unless you believed in your soul of souls that the president of your country and the, and the government was worth dying for? And that's really the situation that we found, right? That, that sort of domino effect over the last two months, many, many, the vast majority of Afghanistan security forces ultimately concluded that in their heart of hearts, the government wasn't worth dying for.
Well, let me follow up with you on that, Jonathan, because I think you're in a good position to to tee up. I think is the question a lot of us are asking ourselves, uh, and a lot of people in government, I suspect, are asking ourselves as well, which is, what is it the Biden administration could have done differently? Um, even if we're taking the Biden administration's commitment to withdrawal as static, as that being the ultimate outcome, because um, I think there are a lot of people who may take a serious issue with how the last few weeks have been uh, handled by the United States government, but nonetheless agree with the overall objective of withdrawal. Um, what Were there opportunities in which um, the United States government could have fortified uh, Afghan forces through airstrikes that would have made a difference, um, through consolidating some of these supply lines, uh, or was the reliance just too baked in um, to be able to adapt it at any sort of time frame um, in the near term, uh, and if you couldn't adapt it with the kind of broad nationwide reach uh, that really the U.S. Afghan strategy had had been, by my understanding, a fairly wide distribution um, of Afghan security forces, um, could there have been or should there have been a discussion about consolidating and centralizing the security forces who are available um, to be able to hold onto a slice of territory, uh, if not, uh, you know, the whole scope of the country as, as would be ideal. Um, do you have a sense of that in, in, in the looking back that you've had the opportunity to do so far? And Laurel Madiha, I'd welcome thoughts from you as well um, after Jonathan. Sure. Yeah. And I'll try to be briefer on this so we can let, uh, let the other guests weigh in as well. I mean, I you know, Biden was in an extremely tough spot having, you know, taken uh, the presidency in January and immediately facing this deadline in the U.S. Taliban agreement to withdraw by the start of March. Um, and so, I, you know, I think he, uh, you know, his announcement happened, uh, obviously, and they didn't have a lot of time to do the types of planning that you would need to do in order to implement that very effectively. Um, right, they didn't get much in the way of and, uh, from the Trump administration. Uh, it, you know, there are reports of the Trump administration, you know, meeting with them, giving them the information they needed in order to hit the ground running. So they were already at sort of a disadvantage, both time wise and in terms of how much information they were given by the previous administration. Uh, so, but in terms of, you know, what else might they have done differently? Well, the, you know, Laurel, for example, and Barney Miller uh, and others published a few papers uh, early on this year that said, why not negotiate with the Taliban some amount of extension, whether six months, eight months, right? Try and give the administration some more time to get itself sorted out, get its policy in place, right? And withdraw responsibly. Uh, and I supported that idea at the time. I mean, I, I, I thought it was a good idea in part because it was clear that the Defense Department had done almost no planning to withdraw to zero in Afghanistan and to continue to do things like, you know, support the Afghan Air Force with contractors, et cetera. Um, and so that would have afforded them more time had they done that. Instead, obviously the president announced we're gonna get out. We're gonna get out by September at the latest. Um, and I don't think either the White House didn't understand uh, or it just wasn't conveyed to them that once that decision was made, that the U.S. military was going to try to get out as quickly as it possibly could to minimize the window of vulnerability to its own forces, right? Ha given the fact that it was withdrawing under threat of fire. And I'm not sure that that was fully appreciated by the White House when that decision was announced. Laura, let me turn it to you. As, as Jonathan mentioned, some of your early commentary on that, and then Medea, I'll come back to you as well for your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I thought um, at the time, at the beginning of the administration, as Jonathan just alluded to, that um, it was pretty clear that a withdrawal, A, was going to happen, and B, wasn't sufficiently planned for and prepared, including in terms of discussions and negotiations with the, uh, the Afghan government in order to, as Medea said earlier, try to mitigate some of the likely fallout of the withdrawal and leave them in the, the best position possible. Um, and that really, you know, was my primary reason for advocating for a six month negotiated delay in the withdrawal date. I mean, I think what you would have said publicly is that it was for purposes of trying to keep going with the peace process efforts. 
Um, but really, I thought the primary reason to do that was to prepare for a withdrawal. Um, you know, it's, I mean, it seemed to me that President Biden's decision to withdraw was going to happen. Um, and that anyone who had been listening to what he'd been saying for many years knew that it was going to happen. I certainly credit the interest in having a genuine policy decision-making process to explore options. Um, but I, you know, I felt that it would be better to have a very short policy process about whether to withdraw or not and a longer policy process for how to withdraw given the inevitability of that decision. I mean, what's tricky about this in practice is to, to quietly make a firm decision and plan for it without people being tipped off that that's what you're doing is difficult to do. Um, but nevertheless, you know, it, it's where I, I would have, what I would have aimed to do more than appears to have been the case publicly and acknowledging that none of us have perfect insight by any means into what was going on um, internally um, within the, the government. Um, the date for withdrawal uh, that was in the US Taliban agreement, I mean, you know, the US did unilaterally declare an extension anyway. So to suggest that you had to be overly hung up about the date that was in the agreement is I think, um, not accurate. Um, I mean, it was supposed to be all forces out by May 1, and the administration said, yeah, no, we're going to be out by September 11th, and the Taliban, you know, was annoyed and then went along with it. So that suggests to me that it was, in fact, feasible to try to work out some kind of delay. I just would have advocated, uh, you know, working that out further in advance so you could try to mitigate what we've seen happen to, to a greater extent. Yeah, I wanna to turn to you, but let me sharpen the question just a little bit on this. Uh, Cause I think if you follow Twitter, you follow where these conversations are happening, you see this weird unity of views among some of the harshest critics of the Biden administration and some of their strident defenders. And the thing they both seem to agree on is that this was inevitable. This was what was gonna happen with withdrawal at some point or another. Um, the critics of the Biden administration say, and that's why we should never withdraw in the first place, the harshest critics. Uh, the defenders of the Biden administration say, this was inevitable, this is gonna happen and we had to withdraw. The United States can't stay in Afghanistan forever. Um, is that assumption credible? Uh, is that something to be taken seriously? Uh, kind of the realities that could have come from this policy decision. Um, is it just a matter of time Back, which I think we should all acknowledge could have made a real difference. Effort, other U.S. priorities. I don't think I agree with that. Um, Afghanistan, uh, or was there? Nope, oh, you're having trouble hearing me, Badia? And I'm having trouble, you're on mute, I think. Yeah, I the last uh, couple of sentences, I'm not sure, uh, Laurel, if you could hear, or Jonathan, I, I had trouble, so I'm just wondering. Yeah, I couldn't. Um, Scott, you might want, I thought maybe it was my video clogging it up, but Scott, you might want to turn off your video temporarily to see Let me that do that. Let me, does that sound better now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, it does. I, the, the last, I, you know, I, um, if, if you could perhaps repeat uh, the, the last couple of uh, parts of your question, I, I, then I, I'm sure, you know, it'll be better for the recording as well. Yeah, absolutely. Let me, let me just do the whole thing. Um, and thank you, audience, for bearing with us again. This is the, this is the joys of a live podcast recording. Um, Medea, I want to turn to you on this question, but I want to sharpen it a little bit. Um, I think we see a weird intersection, uh, a con congruence between some of the views we are hearing from the harshest critics of the Biden administration and some of their most strident defenders. And the point both of those camps seem to be agreeing on is that 
what was happen what has happened in Afghanistan was inevitable. The critics argue, and that's why withdrawal was never a good idea and should never in the first place. Uh, and the proponents uh, or the defenders of the Biden administration say, and that's why what's happening now, as tragic as it is, was unavoidable, and it's not the Biden administration's fault. Um, how credible are is that? assumption is that assertion uh, in your eyes? Um, was it just a matter of delaying the inevitable uh, in terms of uh, you know additional steps that could have been taken, which may have made a difference for evacuation efforts, for certain other policy agendas, but wouldn't have changed the ultimate outcome on the ground in Afghanistan? Um, or is there reason to think there really was a different political reality that could have come out of a decision to withdraw than what we're seeing now? Sure. I, let, let, let me unpack that uh, a little bit, um, if I can. You know, that's a that that's sort of the irony of this. Um, I think the way we have seen things unfold over this weekend was avoidable. If this had been done more deliberately, more carefully, more responsibly, um, as the president promised, you know, on the campaign trail, even as he promised that he would withdraw, he promised there would be a responsible withdrawal. There, you know, Afghanistan is now uh, getting engulfed in a humanitarian crisis. Um, I did not hear from the Biden administration sort of any commitment to addressing that humanitarian crisis over the weekend. I didn't hear any wider message to Afghans um, beyond the people that who have helped the U.S., um, you know, who are in line for special visas, and even they might not get them. You know, they could have been um, evacuated. They could have been flown out earlier. You know, there have been, you know, the, the Biden administration has um, uh, been um, in power for almost seven months now, and that could have been done even, uh, you know, because the withdrawal was anticipated. Um, th that those steps could have been taken. So there is a humanitarian aspect to this um, uh, crisis that hasn't been addressed that certainly could have been addressed better. So I don't think we would have seen the scenes of, you know, sort of the, the helicopters flying over Kabul, the, the people, the Afghans flooding the, the runway of uh, Kabul airport, you know, trying to get a plane and, and you're trying to latch onto a plane and the plane sort of taking off around them. These are these are heartbreaking scenes and they really um, reflect, you know, sort of for what for Afghans will be considered abandonment. So I think so the, one part of it is, it is that this could have been handled better and it was not inevitable that this weekend would unfold this way. I think going back to this uh, sort of on a wider um, uh, sort of broader, longer term decision making, um, uh, sort of platform. I, I, you know, Biden had no good choices when, when um, you know, January 20th rolled around. There were no good choices. I think he had made it clear that he wanted to withdraw. I was always of the view uh, and have argued this, and I, I'm sympathetic, certainly, to the other point of view that um, that we had to withdraw. But I was always of the view that we should withdraw only after a peace deal is reached. And last fall, I argued that that um, there were enough gray areas in the Doha deal to try to um, iron out a peace deal before we withdrew. Um, and this spring, I, I argued that um, we did not need to withdraw unilaterally, given that the Taliban had not lived up to their commitments to cut ties with Al Qaeda. Um, so there were both those kind of loopholes, if you will, in the Doha deal that we could have used. Uh, that being said, you know, I think President Biden not only did not use them, he announced an unconditional withdrawal on April um, on April 12th, throwing out even the, the, the sort of the measly conditionality that the Trump administration had put in into the Doha deal. I think that in some sense really inevitably sort of set the path to the fact that the Taliban would not um, uh, would not sort of negotiate in good faith with the Kabul government, with the Ghani government. And that's what we saw. And in some sense, a military takeover at that point, um, you know, whether through a protracted civil war, if the Afghan forces had fought back, or, you know, just sort of in the, in, uh, the way it's happened now with really uh, abject surrender um, was inevitable. 
But I think there were decisions made both uh, from the Trump administration side and the Biden administration side that made those inevitable. Laurel, let me turn to you. Yeah, you know, a, a comment kind of following on from the very last point that Medea just made. I don't think it's correct to say that everything that we've seen happen in the recent days and weeks was, you know, inexorably inevitable, that an, under any set of circumstances, this would have happened. The reality is more that the set of circumstances became such that it became inevitable. And this, the circumstances related to American political decision-making, how the US government works, how things have been handled over the last few years, the nature of the, the deal that was made between the US and the Taliban in February, 2020 is one factor that I think contributed to the inevitability of the moment because it was very much in the Taliban favor. It gave them their, a victory on their number one objective, a commitment by the foreign forces to withdraw upfront before they made any concessions at all. Now that was a calculated risk that the US made in the hope that that deal could then be converted into an opportunity for a real Afghan peace process. Um, but that's not, that's not what materialized and that, that calculated risk was, was a, you know, turned out to be a bad bet. Um, so, you know, I mean, the only other thing I would say on this is that, you know, you do have to just consider the reality of how the U.S. government works. And there are things that one can say should have, could have been done differently that just were never going to happen differently because of how U.S. political and policy decision making um, works, even if we all hope and wish it might work better. Um, it, you know, back during the second term of the Obama administration and, and towards the end of the administration, when I was at the State Department um, working on, among other things, efforts to get a peace process in Afghanistan going, my number one reason for um, believing very strongly that that should have been a higher priority for the US was because even then, I believed that one day Washington was going to wake up and just want to wash its hands of Afghanistan. And, you know, at a political level, people would look at each other and say, what are we still doing there? You could argue that's right, wrong, whatever, but I just, to me, that seemed inevitable. And because of that, and because it would be much better to have left with a peace agreement intact, and because negotiating some kind of peace agreement was going to take a long time under any circumstances, I thought we should have been much more serious about it, you know, six, seven years ago than, uh, than we were at the time. And by the time the Trump administration rolled around and midway through decided and uh, conveyed publicly how strongly they wanted to get out, you know, there was just no deal you were ever going to make in those circumstances that wasn't going to hasten the day that we've now seen passed. I, I want to move to, to begin to look forward shortly, but before we do, I, I want to come to one last question for you, Jonathan, um, in this vein on this question of, of alternative paths that might have been taken. Uh, another perspective um, we are seeing uh, from, from very expert voices um, is the view that there was a relatively stable status quo early on when the Biden administration came in or, or approximate to it in terms of a relatively low US troop commitment um, that would was able to stabilize the situation, not just troop commitment, but also other resources. Um, but I know that's an argument you've engaged with online and, and um, I want to turn it over to you to your perspective as to whether that's accurate or not. Sorry, you, you broke up on me just at the very end there. Could you just re repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah, let me, let me rephrase it again. Jonathan, let me turn to you with one last aspect of this. Uh, I, I, online, I know you've engaged with an argument that we have seen from some fairly notable figures uh, arguing that 
in fact, the Biden administration inherited a pretty stable status quo um, that was relatively affordable for the Biden administration for the United States in terms of troop commitment, other resources um, that uh, forestalled, uh, you know, some of the worst outcomes coming. This is a, a version of the critique of idea of withdrawal altogether. Um, what is your reaction to that? Because I, I, I know you've engaged in this argument, and Laurel Medihi, I'd welcome thoughts from you as well. Yeah, sure. No, I appreciate the question. Um, I, I mean, those arguments, a lot of which were advanced even in advance, you know, ahead of uh, the president's decision to withdraw when there was sort of robust arguments amongst, you know, think tanks and foreign policy types as to what we should do. The argument to stay usually revolved around two factors, which you mentioned. One was the idea of cost, that the U.S. had found itself in a place where you know, we were, quote unquote, only spending somewhere in the vicinity of 20 to 30 billion dollars a year on Afghanistan. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we hadn't had a U.S. casualty in uh, well over a year. Right. And so the idea was that the costs, quote unquote, were relatively low. And the second was the second idea was that it was a stable environment uh, in which uh, the U.S. could maintain 2,500 or, you know, some smallish thousands of troops and that those troops could continue to do counterterrorism activities from there to keep a lid on the likes of Al-Qaeda and ISIS and do a little bit of training uh, on the side, perhaps, right? And that was sort of the view. Now, I, I take issue with both of those arguments. Um, the you know, on the issue of cost, while it's true the cost to the U.S. was, you know, supposedly low, uh, in, you know, in grand figures, people would say, oh, you know, 20 to $30 billion is a rounding error in the Department of Defense budget. I mean, as a U.S. taxpayer, I still find that an offensive notion that we're just sort of throwing, you know, 20 or $30 billion numbers around like that's like that's chump change. I mean, that, that, is a, that is a sizable amount of money that the U.S. could do a lot with uh, when purposed towards other things. So there are, you know, there are opportunity costs with respect uh, to this. But it also, I think the more important point is it blatantly ignores the costs that were, you know, being paid by the Afghan people. You know, when, when they say things like, well, the U.S. hadn't suffered a casualty in over a year, you know, sure, that's true. I mean, it's also a function of the U.S. Taliban agreement, and, and I'll, maybe I'll leave it to Moral or Medea to explain that part of it, right? But it, on the Afghan side, thousands of Afghans were being killed every year uh, for the last, you know, how many years? Uh, in this situation. And had we stayed, even if it was a stable environment, I'll get that in a second, the price that would have been paid by Afghans would have continually been thousands of dead Afghans year in and year out in perpetuity. And I personally find that, you know, uh, an affront. I, I, am, I don't see that as quote unquote low cost. Uh, so that's the first thing. On the stable environment piece, I would say, right, the people who make that argument are generally speaking people who didn't follow Afghanistan beyond the sort of macro headline level since 2015. And what they'll argue is, you know, oh, well, we've had troops there at this low level since 2015, and we've been able to do presumably what we wanted to be able to do. So it's fine, right? It, we could have continued to do that again in perpetuity. But the reality is if you look at micro levels, the Taliban had been making steady gains, especially in rural areas, uh, encroaching on, you know, capturing more districts, encroaching on the district centers and others steadily since 2015. And even before Biden's announcement earlier this year, I was asked to give a brief uh, to a government audience. And I sat down and, and sort of, you know, did an assessment of how many provincial capitals had the Taliban already effectively surrounded. This was like in January. And the answer was 12 or 15, you know, nearly half, a third to a half of the country's provincial capitals were already effectively surrounded by the Taliban at that time. So the idea that you could keep some smallish thousand number of troops in Afghanistan, you know, as a sort of in perpetuity stable environment, again, was just fallacious. It was not a, uh, or sorry, fictitious. It was not a um, stable environment. It was a, it was a tactically eroding one and it has been for some time. 
Laurel and Medea, do you have anything uh, to add to that? Um, and particularly just on the, on the general ideas of it was the status quo that that existed prior to the decision withdrawal. Was that something sustainable um, or or something close to sustainable? Um, or, or was it something that inevitably we, we was not going to be able to uh, uh, lead to a more positive outcome? Um, I, mean, I can jump in on that, and Medea may have thoughts as well. But you know, I think what uh, what Jonathan has described as not a steady state um, situation, an eroding, but rather an eroding situation in terms of the military situation, um, was also paralleled on the political side. And uh, I think what you had seen on the political side was not a self-sustaining um, arrangement in terms of confidence of political actors in the leadership of the Afghan government and the survivability of the Afghan government in the absence of direct presence and that degree of support from its um, from its main patron, the United States. Now, I mean, it has to be said, you know, I think what the, the administration was leaning on was the idea that they were continuing to promise to provide support for the Afghan government, monetary support, uh, and some continued training support and other forms of material support for the Afghan security forces. And I think the hope had been that that would be the counter to the concerns about the survivability of the Afghan government, but that um, turned out to be, uh, you know, a false hope, or at least one that that didn't match the the reality. I I would just add to this, and it's something Jonathan, who's written about it, might have something to add to as well. I think there's been an exaggerated reliance um, on the part of U.S government thinkers and even some thinkers and analysts outside of government on the fact that after the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan, the Najibullah regime that, that was then governing the country hung on for, um, and that was a client of the, of the Soviet Union, for those of you who are too young to remember some of this, um, survived for another three years while the Soviet Union still existed and uh, was providing financial support. And it was only after that financial support was cut off as the Soviet Union disintegrated that the Najibullah regime um, failed. And, you know, some um, people have drawn too simplistic, in my view, um, a conclusion from that, which is so long as the U.S. government keeps the spigot of dollars open, the Ghani government would survive. I think there were a lot of reasons to question that comparison and uh, and we've seen it now that you know just keeping the money flowing wasn't enough. Jonathan? Yeah, sorry, I, just a very brief point on that, right? Um, and I'll, I'll you know highlight, I wrote a paper in The Diplomat on this specific point and just two quick things I would point out. One is when the Soviets withdrew, they had a very, very well-crafted and very well sort of synchronized whole of government plan for what they wanted to do uh, with respect to Afghanistan after their withdrawal. That was worked out well in advance of their withdrawal and it was a very, very good, again, and well-synchronized plan. The second thing is they had a client in Najibullah, right, whose goals were the survival of himself and his regime, which were exactly the same goals as the Soviets. So they had almost 100% alignment of patron and client goals in that relationship. The US, as it withdrew here, had neither of those things. We did not have any semblance of a, of a plan, really, much less one that was you know, well synchronized across the interagency. And the second is President Ghani's goals were definitely not 100% aligned with the US's goals in a post-withdrawal situation. So I'll just leave it there. All right. Well, I want to shift and begin to talk about what comes next. Um, uh, oh, sorry, Amadea. Oh, please. Yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, I you know just just one thing to add uh, based on you know what what Laurel and Jonathan have said. I think you know I, I, I'm sympathetic certainly to the argument that this was not sustainable in the in the longer term. Um, but in the and as Jonathan said, it was an eroding situation. I think my only point, and I, I made this earlier as well. You know, my view was that there was a way, probably not an easy one, perhaps to make it sustainable in the short to medium term so that the Afghan government, the erstwhile Afghan government now, and the Taliban could iron out a peace deal. Trump made that, you know, the, the Doha deal made that very, very difficult. Uh, but there was potentially a way, uh, given that the Taliban weren't meeting their conditions, to try to make um, our presence there the leverage upon which the um, the Afghan government and um, the, the the Taliban would agree um, on a peace deal, and then we could leave. Things could have unraveled after that peace deal too, um, but at least we would have left with uh, with a, a peace deal rather than um, you know uh, sort of this military victory uh, of the Taliban. Well, Medea, in the time we have left, I want to start looking forward, um, although there's a lot that's unknown about what comes next in Afghanistan. But let's start with the people in charge, the Taliban, uh, who, who appear to be in charge, at least, of the state for the time being. Um, what can you tell us about this Taliban movement that has come into power? Uh, how much does it look like the Taliban movement that controlled a good chunk of the country in the 1990s? Um, are there differences? Have they departed? And, and are there other factions and political interests and groups in play or seem likely to come into play, either in opposition to the Taliban or in cooperation with them, that are going to shape the political outcome? And, and one particular question I think is going to weigh heavily in the minds of a lot of people that I particularly want to put to you in evaluating this is, you know, the big exchange, the big focus that the United States um, has gotten out of this. The one thing that a lot of people still hang their hat on is uh, you know, the commitment um, that the Afghanistan will not be used as a base for international terrorism moving forward uh, as it was in the 1990s. How credible is that commitment? Uh, how credibly can the Taliban or whatever political, political institution that comes next uh, stick to that uh, commitment? Or uh, do they have the infrastructural control and ability to project force necessary to enforce something like that? Or, or is at this point, really, is it more of a measure of good faith? Sure. I, you know, I think there's, there's still quite a bit that is uncertain. So, you know, the, the caveat here is that I'll answer with what we, we do know, given that it's, it's been about 24 hours since uh, the, the fall of Kabul uh, to, the, to the Taliban. I think this Taliban is different in terms of its political sort of diplomatic kind of rhetorical um, nature and, and the political savvy that it's presenting to the outside world. Um, this Taliban is different in that way from the Taliban of, you know, that, that ruled Afghanistan from 96 to 2001. So they can make promises. They're able to communicate with Western journalists, with foreign governments. They struck a deal with the United States um, and they're, 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 they're talking a good talk, right? But, but talk is cheap. And so what we see on the ground so far gives no indication that they will be any different uh, from the Taliban of the 1990s. In the areas that they've taken over, they're preventing women from going to work, they're preventing girls from going to school, they're behaving in exactly the same way um, as uh, they did in the 1990s. In the, um, in the, uh, in Kabul, you know, there are, there are early reports coming out that they are going around people's houses um, and taking away musical instruments. I mean, there's, there's, it, this is all a repeat of the 1990s, where they are different, as I said before, is in how they've been able to communicate to the outside world. Um, but all of this, you know, we'll, we'll wait to see if any of that translates uh, into any changes on the ground. But right now, I would not trust the Taliban on, you know, sort of how 
how they are going to rule over our Afghans, you know, the human rights that they're going to provide. I wouldn't trust them on anything. And I would go back to the way I would, I, you know, my bet is that they'll go back to the way that they were in the 90s. The one thing I'll, um, the to, to your question about, you know, sort of um, them guaranteeing uh, to the outside world that they're not going to let Afghanistan be to be used as a base for launching terror attacks. I mean, that's in some sense their big promise to the to the outside world, um, you know, to China, to the U.S. and, and others. Um, and I honestly don't believe uh, that, given sort of their ideological stance, uh, that they will be able to follow through on that promise. They can't guarantee it. Um, and uh, and and. Honestly, I would be very, very surprised if they, they're able to follow through on that. But I think jihadist groups uh, across the board and certainly Al-Qaeda um, will be emboldened under Taliban rule. Laurel, let me turn to you with the next uh, you know, phase of this, which is that if we can't be confident that uh, Afghanistan is going to stick to its commitments uh, or some of its rhetoric, uh, probably the Taliban is stick to its commitments, some of its rhetoric about human rights, um, humanitarian issues, um, uh, or the most under, you know, fundamental underlying commitment, uh, at least from a, a US official policy perspective of um, not providing a haven for terrorism. Um, wh what are the points of leverage the United States still has in play or the international community, uh, European allies? A lot of the post withdrawal planning was premised on the assumption that there would still be local partners and a robust, frankly, diplomatic presence that would be able to provide a vehicle for aid, assistance, uh, and other mechanisms. Obviously, all of that seems to be off the table. If there's any diplomatic, U.S. diplomatic presence seems like, like to be extremely slim. Um, so, so what are the remaining sources of leverage available to other uh, parties in the international community um, who've got an interest in, in how things play out next in Afghanistan? Yeah, I mean, I think the greatest leverage is in the hands of the regional powers, Pakistan, Iran, China, Russia, to a lesser extent, uh, the Central Asian states, uh, because those are the governments that, first of all, have the greatest interest in the situation in Afghanistan still, and also I think that's really at this stage the primary audience that the Taliban has in mind for its foreign policy. Um, so for the US part, I think it's a question of working you know, with and through as it can those regional powers to try to exercise some influence over how the Taliban governs in Afghanistan. Um, the, you know, I think the Taliban have been smart enough to appreciate that um, in their foreign policy, that it's unlikely that in power, although they would like to still have development assistance, that they're really going to be able to govern in a way that, uh, that attracts that assistance from European powers, at least, and maybe the US as well. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I do think that it's nearly impossible to fathom that European standards for um, governance can be met by the Taliban and that there will be development assistance continuing to flow to a Taliban government from the Europe, uh, from Europe. I mean, it has to be said also, the majority of American assistance at this stage is from, is for security um, institutions and security forces and the Taliban's not going to want that. So that's off the, the table already. The, the US has leaned in recent weeks and, and months very heavily on this idea that the potential for the Taliban to gain legitimacy and attract financial assistance um, is significant leverage over them. But I think it's the US has leaned on that just because that's what it had to offer as a carrot and a stick, um, not because that was ever going to be particularly effective. And now we're in a context where it's really not going to be um, effective because there is no other power. They are the de facto power. They have come to power in a way where there's no competition left standing for them. And it's unquestionable to me that, um, that the regional governments are going to recognize them as the legitimate enough power in Afghanistan. And they're, at least for the time being, not going to be the pariah state that they 
feared they were going to be. So it's, you know, the, the U.S. influence over the situation, as I said, is, is not going to be unilateral any longer um, because it doesn't have that partner in Afghanistan over which it had the most influence. The U.S. influence is going to be have to be exerted in cooperation with the regional powers, and that's very difficult to do when you're talking about Iran, China, Russia, and Pakistan as the key regional powers. We're a little past time, but I want to turn to you, Jonathan, with one closing question, which is another part of the original plan for the post-withdrawal scenario in Afghanistan for the United States was the ability to maintain some sort of over the horizon military capability in the event you did see an Al Qaeda resurgence, uh, potentially for other purposes as well, I suppose. Uh, but we haven't really seen, to my knowledge at least, efforts to negotiate another regional uh, base um, for aircraft and for other um, US operations having any success so far. Obviously, it doesn't seem likely that there's going to be any military, U.S. military presence in Afghanistan. Right now, it's boiled down to Kabul International Airport, um, which the military is trying to maintain control over um, for the purpose of evacuation of U.S. Uh, allied personnel, some Afghan uh, partners, um, but but not as many as perhaps uh, will, would like to be pulled out. That depends on how long they can maintain that control and how long the Taliban seems amenable to it, I suppose. What are the options left militarily for the United States? Um, obviously, the United States did project force into the Afghanistan in the 1990s um, through rocket attacks and sort of other measures and, and may have different capabilities now. But um, are we much more limited for this uh, because of the challenging neighborhood and the inability to secure an alternative place to house our a military presence in the region? Yeah, I mean, you're right. It, it did seem like there were some engagements uh, by the Biden administration with regional countries, right? There were a bunch of meetings with uh, Central Asian state leaders, et cetera. And, and while they never said it out loud, it seemed like they were you know, testing the waters of the potential of a US military counterterrorism presence there. And, and none of those efforts appeared to come to fruition. So you're at a position now where obviously the US can't have a military footprint in Afghanistan. The best it's gonna be able to do is to have that over the horizon capability, uh, which it has stated is, is in Qatar these days, uh, right? They've stood up an over the horizon uh, CT command there uh, that, that will ostensibly have the, you know, what assets the US military can afford to dedicate to that type of mission will, will be operated from there. The real question is intelligence though, right? I mean, it, it's one thing to have uh, airplanes and drones stationed if even as far away as Qatar, I mean, they could still range Afghanistan, assuming Pakistan allows them to overfly its airspace, but you need to know where to strike. Um, you need to have intelligence on where the terrorist groups are, where they're operating, you know, and, and not, not the type of, you know, well, they were there two days ago type of intelligence, but you need the intelligence of they're gonna be there tomorrow at this particular time so you could get uh, an air asset overhead. That's very, very hard to do if you don't have a presence in country. And so, you know, with the, with the U.S. now evacuating its embassy, uh, it looks like we're going to have, you know, sort of zero presence in country. Uh, that effectively turns Afghanistan into an intel a bit of an intelligence black hole. I mean, the best you can do is then look at it from satellites and that type of thing. So I, while it seems unlikely the U.S. military will be able to get a presence in a neighboring country, I would expect the U.S. now to try and see if it could get some type of intelligence presence, yeah, you know, either in sort of uh, the border regions of Pakistan or perhaps uh, in Tajikistan or Uzbekistan, right? Get close enough that you might be able to do some amount of intelligence collection uh, to aid this over the, the horizon counterterrorism uh, platform that the U.S. has established. And if it, if it can't do that, it's gonna be really, really difficult to monitor what happens with the likes of Al Qaeda and ISIS going forward. Well, we will have to leave the conversation there. Laurel, Jonathan Madiha, thank you very much for joining us here today on the Lawfare Podcast. Thanks for having me. Thanks, thanks to everyone. Yes, thank you very much.
And another thank you to our live audience for this live podcast recording, uh, both for listening in uh, and for sticking with us through some technical issues. Um, we uh, will maybe doing more of these as we wrestle with some of these ongoing developments uh, over the next few days. So please keep an eye on lawfareblog.com um, uh, moving forward uh, as we uh, stay tuned uh, for additional live podcast recordings and similar events. We'll also be having uh, our weekly Lawfare Live series with Lawfare authors for Lawfare Patreon supporters, which you can find more information about on our website. Um, this edition will be released uh, in the next podcast in the Lawfare Podcast queue in slightly edited format so you'll be able to find the audio there as well until then thank you for joining us and have a good week goodbye